Welcome to our amazing students and future colleagues. My name is Dan Brown and I would like to introduce Clinical Thought of the Week, hashtag the blocking tutor. I will only take up a few minutes of your precious time. One of my medical mottos is how we should continue to learn and grow through simple thought-provoking clinical stories. This will help foster lateral thinking and extend our knowledge base. Now relax, take a coffee. This is not a lecture. These are informal glimpses at a range of topics which will leave you pondering. Big disclaimer, do your research to clarify the evidence base for any of the statements I make here today. Question what I say and question what I write. So what is the clinical thought of the week? Let's take off and escape to somewhere exotic. Where would you like to fly to? Destination, the island of Mauritius, deep in the Indian Ocean. Now, what could this beautiful island have to do with osteopathy? What connects the two? Well, imagine if your working life was different. If you substituted your cosy practice for the hard graft and toil of the sugarcane plantations of Mauritius. And the dangers, the use of such deadly tools in close proximity to others. What could happen? Well, whilst absolutely carrying out your work one day, you accidentally land a machete into your colleague's back. Ouch! Now, if this happens, who are you going to call? Well, our friendly neighbourhood Ghostbusters are no help in this situation. Stuff like that only happens in movies. So instead, try this geezer. Charles Edward Brown Sequard, an eminent Mauritian-born neurologist pioneering of his time. Now, he would witness these gruesome machete wounds on plantation workers and observe the neurological dysfunction that would result. Wow, all in the name of science. He became the first to describe what is now called brown sequard syndrome, or hemisection of the spinal cord. Now, this picture may be familiar to you and represents loss of both motor and sensory pathways. This may include the corticospinal tract, posterior columns, and spinothalamic tract, and others, but more on this in a moment. Interesting to note that other neurologists of the time attempted to confirm Brown Sequard's work with quite bizarre experiments. One such gentleman was French born neurologist Paul Loy. Now he decided to guillotine hundreds of dogs and studied their physiological response. How deplorable! Unfortunately, with very little results. Now let's return to Brown's Aquan syndrome. In practice, we do not see many hemisections, if at all, but we are likely to encounter a more subtle impingement of the spinal cord. This may be inflammatory processes such as rheumatoid arthritis, tumour, cancers or infection. But more commonly, it will be degeneration of the spine or discogenic prolapses that may potentially compress the cord. An example of this would be a cervical myelopathy. Now this MRI depicts spondylotic changes around C5 to 7 with subsequent cord compression, a myelopathy. You may have also heard of Lermit sign or the barber's chair sign. This is where full flexion or extension of the neck may stretch or compress the spinal cord against any of these structural changes and result in electric shock type sensation in the arms and legs. Now this is rather crude. We need to consider very carefully what travels up and down this spinal highway in honour of Brown Sequard. This is of course the ascending and descending tracks. These can be quite difficult to learn so I always say remember three key things. One, whether they travel up or down, meaning whether they're sensory or motor. Two, what they carry, for example, vibration. And three, where they cross or decussate. If we know this, then we can begin to work out what neurological deficit may result. Get your tutors to help you with this. Now you have some excellent learning resources to hand. When I was a student, there was no Google, no internet. We would go to the librarian, ask for a journal, and if we were lucky, within days, maybe weeks, it would materialise. Now you 
have some beautiful graphical images you can access in seconds, such as those shown here. On the left hand side depicts a finger relaying joint position sense or proprioception back to the cortex. It also shows Pacinian corpuscles, which are mechanoreceptors, which carry vibration and pressure sensitivity to the cortex. These are both carried in the posterior columns and decussate in the medulla. Hence, any impingement of the cord will give ipsilateral signs and symptoms. On the right hand side, if you can see past my head, depicts the spinothalamic tract. Now, this carries pain and temperature and enters and crosses at the level of the spinal cord. Hence, any impingement of the cord will likely result in contralateral signs and symptoms. These are just two examples of what Brown's Acquired has given us. There is a continual need to raise the awareness of myelopathy in the osteopathic profession. This is from a recent publication in the IO magazine. It discusses how osteopaths can raise the profile of cervical spondylotic myelopathy in practice. It provides a very useful link to patients who tell their own stories of having this condition. Now, do not be too alarmed. Calm down. It can be a complicated subject. Firstly, revise your neurology. Secondly, try to evaluate the clinical signs and symptoms of cord compression. And thirdly, consider how you would screen for this if presented in your practice. Finally, do a little research on the island of Mauritius. Give credit to our friend Charles Edward Brown Saquard. I hope you've enjoyed this. It's time to say goodbye. And until the next time, hashtag the blogging tutor. Thank you.